Dr. Dennis Ferris. Here we are, Reno, Nevada. We're normally in the Battleborn, uh, you know, RV where we've got everything in the RV. This whole podcast, the Build Podcast, is ran by Battleborn Batteries. But we're kind of on the last leg of our Western tour here, and we're stopping by Reno, Nevada. We're actually on your set. This is the Dragonfly Energy set. Uh, the Limitless Energy podcast set. So welcome to your own podcast set, Dennis. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to the Limitless Energy <laughs> podcast set. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of a weird thing um, where, again, like we just finished the Juan Bass U.S. Open, uh, guys like Rick Klun, uh, many other uh, iconic Western anglers participate in this one tournament. Um, and what's crazy is like, you know, we decided not to bring the RV but being out here in the desert, you know, between Las Vegas and Reno, we're seeing all of the, uh, let's say, recreational vehicles out here in the middle of the desert. And I will bet you nine out of 10 of them are equipped with some type of lithium technology, solar technology. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Why are you giving me the looks already? It's an interesting intro. <laughs> um, so, Dennis, uh, just a quick rundown. I'd don't want to spend too much time, but your background before Battleborn, you were a Stanford professor? Not at Stanford. Not no. at Stanford. Uh, I was, my last job before starting Dragonfly was, I was a professor at USC. USC, mm -hmm. Southern okay. California. Yep. Yeah. So, and then how did, if I remember, you started kind of Battleborn in your garage or something, or did I get that wrong? Yeah, no, that's, that's true. I, I started working in my garage while I was a professor at USC. And the reason is it has to do with technology. When you're a professor and you develop new technology, the university owns all of it. Oh, And so my first sort of foray into having a company was when I was at USC and I had developed some technology with a colleague. We filed a provisional patent. Mm -hmm. Um and the school would not file a non-provisional patent, which make, me, means making it permanent, mm -hmm. unless they had a company license it. So I was like, all right, well, let's start a company to to license it. So we did. We started a company down in L.A. Um, and we were unable to come to an agreement with USC to license the patent. It was just too expensive for us. Wow. So I thought, well, that's stupid. Like, why would I develop right, yeah. anything at USC? Right. You know, so... I started, I got in the habit of just like setting up a lab in my garage and just working my garage at nights, you know, weekends and stuff. And so that's how I ended up developing the technology that would become Dragonfly Energy and Battleborn Batteries um, was in my garage. And mm -hmm. I filed the patent and moved up to Reno, quit my faculty job, uh, got an MBA and started the company. Wow. Congratulations. Were that's you up. nervous to make that jump? Or were you pretty confident in where the industry was headed and what you had going on? I would say it was a little scary, but I was also sick of being a professor. So it was exciting. It was more exciting, I think, than anything. Um, I, at the time, uh, lithium was pretty young. And it was clear that after the cost of solar energy and wind energy came way down, that the bottleneck for the greater incorporation of of those renewable energy sources was the storage mm -hmm. was the lithium and mm -hmm. so i knew that eventually it would become a big big deal it is a big deal now and i also knew that there was a lot of lithium in the ground here in nevada so it made sense to leave california and start a company here there's a lot of good reasons to leave california and lithium in the ground in nevada is is <laughs> one of them it's, it's definitely one of them. one of them and and nevada's been great to us yeah. uh the the governor of the state at the time, Brian Sandoval, was incredibly welcoming. friendly and welcoming yeah. to, to us. I mean, he did a great job, uh, you know, turning the economy around. It, Nevada was in bad shape back then. And he's now the president of the university here, UNR. Oh, cool. Very, Very cool. cool. Are there a lot of lithium companies in the United States? Um, li lithium Battery companies or lithium mining companies? Or uh, battery mean? companies, we'll say that. They're, so I would say yes, but they're all over there's they're all over the place in terms of the supply chain. Um, there are companies that buy batteries, import them, and sell them. Mm -hmm. Those are the majority of them. Right. That's, that's what they do. There's not a lot of pack assemblers the way we are. 
um, certainly not in our space. Um, there are pack assemblers who make battery packs for electric vehicles. What's a pack assembler? I'm sorry. It's when you take the the cells mm-hmm. and you assemble them into battery packs, which is like gotcha. this. That's a battery yep. pack. So It's got a bunch of cells inside of it. So there's only a few doing that here. Most people just import them already. The whole yeah, package. That's right. They okay. import the, the whole package. So I would say, so like the reason why we're here today is to, I guess, you know, kind of teach, you know, the fishing industry, right? The fishing and boating industry. We have a lot of viewers from that industry, obviously, and then some outside of that. But the the demand for power in a 21-foot bass boat, whether, you know, it's an older bass boat, a newer bass boat, you know, you know, live scope technology, live technology, 360 technology, all kinds of mapping and 2D, we're putting more and more crap on our boats, right? And the demand for power... Uh, is at the all time high in the bass in the in the bass fishing world. And let's face it, if you're on the elite series like I am, if you want to be competitive, you got to have four different screens. You know, each six, some yeah, six, six sometimes with live technology and all these different transducers, and roughly a like two amp draw for you know for each and every screen. So when we put a hundred amp hour battery in our boat, you know we want the longest lasting available. And we're so competitive out there that sun up to sun down, we're demanding all this power from these batteries. But we're seeing more and more lithium lithium battery companies pop up in the fishing space. But I'm willing to bet, you know, most of them are just like what you said, where they import or they literally buy the batteries, import them, and then sell them as a package. Yeah, that's one of the biggest questions I think I've seen is how do you differentiate um, the different battery options and companies out there? Mm-hmm. Because there's so many in our space that have popped up. How do you know one who is making their own pack, and two, why does that matter? I honestly don't know of a of another one that is actually assembling the packs here. here. Um, so just Battleborn, to your knowledge, in this space, in, okay. the, in this space, to to my knowledge, yeah, I think you can certainly buy a completed pack from overseas and slap a sticker on it. Yeah. You know, uh, what is different about us is that we actually designed the packs. Uh, we make them here. You can see our factory, you know, there's a bunch of videos online. Like yeah. we are, we employ, you know, almost 200 Nevadans um, to awesome. to actually put these packs together. And the reason it's important is because if you're importing a whole pack, you can't really quality test it, right? So we can quality test every piece of metal, every injection mold, piece of injection mold, of course, every cell, mm-hmm. and we we have very stringent um, procedures when it comes to taking the cells, making sure each individual cell mm-hmm. is up to snuff, putting them into modules, and then cycling every module, measuring the capacity of every module, then capacity matching those modules. So when you put them in series to make a 12 or 24 volt pack, they are identical capacity. And that's important so that they charge and drain in the exact same way. And, um, you know, you if you come to our factory floor, have you been on the factory we floor? We will in a couple hours. All right, yeah. great. So you'll, <laughs> you'll get a better idea and you yeah. can, you know, tell yeah. your audience after the fact. Yeah. But it's actually a pretty intensive uh, process for us. So, I mean, that's the main difference really is quality. And, of course, when you make your own packs, we know exactly what's going on with them yeah. when they're out in the field. So we've got the, you know, the world renowned Battleborn technical support team. It's crazy. Like you just go on Amazon, Amazon.com and and uh the the amount of five star reviews that that battery right there, the Battleborn hundred amp hour battery gets, these are like real people from all over the country, all over the world, really. But like the the amount of five star reviews is unbelievable. Uh, you know, whether that's you know, customer support, whether that's you know the, the product itself. Uh, it's literally life changing. So, um, like getting into the nuts and bolts, you keep on saying cell, like the cell, the lithium phosphate cell. Is this is that correct terminology? Mm-hmm. That's the yes. actual power, but you have to divert and uh, kind of harness that power into twelve volts. I mean, just a quick rundown of the nuts and bolts, um, and kind of layman's fisherman's term of what exactly life PO is, um, you know, and how it uh, how it or why it belongs in a bass boat. 
Lithium iron phosphate, yep. which is Life PO, yep. is a specific type of lithium ion battery. Okay. It's it's a um it's the it's the cathode material. And the reason that it works great in a bass boat is when you put four life post cells in series, you get a 12 volt battery. Yeah. So when you were used to an AGM battery, uh, a battery like this can basically drop in and operate and right, function. Right. Uh, so that's why that's good. The other reason is that compared to the battery that is in your cell phone or in your electric vehicle, it's a lot less volatile. So you don't have to worry so much about the dangers of fire. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, sorry to interrupt you. What makes a, a lithium battery volatile? Because you hear that a lot especially people in our industry who aren't familiar. Um, we've had fires, you know, in the past in, in competitors' boats. And so people are scared to run lithium still in our industry. Mm -hmm. So what causes that volatility and, and what do you do to what, what differentiates the different companies and how volatile? And why can't you fly with it either? With that, like when you go to like ship something, <laughs> FedEx or something, it asks you, are you shipping lithium batteries? If so, then it's like a special thing. Mm -hmm. Like why? All right. There's a lot of questions here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, certainly Department of Transportation has its rules as to how you ship any lithium ion battery. Um, I'll have to get Back to that issue, yeah, yeah, we yeah. only ship legally, yeah. which is different than yeah. almost every other battery. Company. Wow. Um, so why are battery, why are lithium ion batteries flammable? It's because inside each cell, you have a liquid electrolyte and that liquid electrolyte can react with air and therefore it can, it, it is in itself flammable. Now it's, when it's inside the cell, there's no oxygen to cause the fire. fire. So it's just safe when it's in the cell. Um, but if the cell gets hot for whatever reason, oxygen can be created from inside the cell and then it will react and potentially explode. Wow. That's called thermal runaway. Um, lithium iron phosphate is less likely to have that happen because it's harder to make oxygen inside the cell compared to in your cell phone or laptop battery. Okay. Uh. So there's that. The chemistry is safer. Now, the way that we do our battery packs is we have... Like in this battery, we've got 120 of these small cylindrical cells that are separated by an air gap. So it makes it a little less energy dense. But the reason that we do that is if in the very, very uh, infrequent case where something goes wrong Hot. with the cell, yeah. it will not propagate to the next cell. So you might not even know. So you just you lose one of the 120. In the worst possible case scenario that you get a thermal runaway event it wouldn't propagate to another cell. Uh, Plus, each one of the individual cells has a burst cap that if the temperature or pressure go up, it will burst and then the the pressure falls. It takes that cell out, and but you don't have any dangerous... So it's situation. a safe malfunction if it happens. So if, if, yeah, if, yeah. I, if I wanted to start my own battery company and slap a sticker on it and I just bring in a pack from, from overseas, how many... How do they do it? Do they do it the same way? Uh, typically not. Typically they use prismatic cells, um, mm -hmm. and they kind of, uh, pack them in as, as tight as they can get them, Okay, which is good for energy density. But our focus generally is safety, um, and longevity and performance. So with that design, we have more thermal stability so that the cells last a lot longer. And that's ultimately what, what we want to happen. Right. And you uh, said these cells are uh, a liquid electrolyte. So was it like Gatorade? I mean, little Gatorade cells, liquid electrolyte. It's not Gatorade. It's no. actually <laughs> ethylene carbonate. Okay. But okay. It, yeah. Close. Don't, close. Don't drink it. No. Yeah. <laughs> And then um, the other thing, too, is like, so with AGM batteries, um, most people don't understand, like, you know, when a guy, you know, drops this thing and is, you know, takes the AG, heavy AGM out, drops a 100 amp hour Battleborn in there, hooks it right up, red to red, black to black, uh, you know, they're kind of thinking old school lead, old school, you know, wet cell lead or, or, or AGM or whatever. Um, with that, with that uh, live PO power, um, kind of above that is the BMS, right? Explain to what a BMS is. So AGMs don't have it. Uh, you know, old wet lead cells don't have a mm -hmm. BMS. Right. So in addition to the cells inside the battery, you've got uh, all the metals to carry the current and the structure of the plastics. And then you have this circuitry inside uh, called the battery management system, the BMS. And so with our BMS, we've basically 
designed the logic to protect the cells, protect the user over many years of operation. So we've gotten really good at at making a very stable BMS. Mm-hmm. What the BMS does is it will monitor, uh, or what it should do, is monitor the the temperature, current, voltage, rates of change of all of these parameters for each individual cell. Uh-huh. And when it detects something that is a little bit outside the range of the operating parameters of the cell, it will act. So the BMS can cut off the charging current or the discharging current. It can cut it off temporarily. It can disconnect it indefinitely if it thinks there's a short circuit. It's smart. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what, you know, that's what our BMS does. Does So every lithium has a BMS? Every lithium battery? It should. It it certainly should. There are, there are on the market that have no BMS, obviously, but um, the, one way to tell if it's a good battery typically is if it's third party listed. If you're listed to, um, so there are listing agencies, underwriter laboratories, the most famous one, UL, huh. UL listing. We actually work with a couple. Uh, Intertech Lab is one that we work with frequently. They give the ETL s- symbol. And um, there are lithium battery packs, pack listings where those labs will basically try to destroy these batteries. You know, they'll, They'll drop them, throw them against the wall. They'll do all kinds of crazy, you know, short circuit. And and so this is the most listed pack on the market. We've got a, wow. a, an ETL 2054, uh, IEC 62133, a UN 38.3, all third-party listed. And each time we get a listing, they subject these batteries to basically destructive testing and ensure that nothing unsafe happens. And that's how you can tell if it's a well So a battery. consumer can go to these place these what you these listers I don't know what to call them but I could go to their website and look up You can just look on the label. Yeah. So, you, so yeah, we've got the ETL Okay. The ETL listing. So that's right something if I'm a consumer, I'm Baspo, I'm trying to put lithiums in my boat and I'm looking through all these companies, I should be looking for an ETL Listing. An ETL lab lab test certification UL. So there okay. are third party listings. Okay. I will I will say that these listings are important uh, because if you look at the RV industry, for mm-hmm. example, the RVIA requires you to have a listing to wow. for an OEM to put for an RV manufacturer to put a lithium battery on on the RV. And now the ABYC, the American Boat Yacht Consortium, is starting to adopt these Recognize same rules. Recognize that as well. Oh, cool. Because insurance companies are kind of sick of lithium fires on boats. Wow. So they're like, we should have a standard here. And so That's the good. new ABYC sense. recommended standards are going to require listings like this. For for things to be installed at an OEM level, I That's assume. right. Well, even, that's for RVs. But for a boat, if you want to insure your boat, then you have to have... Uh, okay. uh, insurance companies are going to start looking to these standards. Very cool. So that's that's good. why it's important now. So um, there are uh, obviously a lot of cheap batteries on the market now. I mean, mm-hmm. if you look at at Amazon and look it's up crazy hundred amp hour batteries, um, you know you'll find something like this for like two hundred ninety nine dollars right. or something, which which is obviously less than the cost it takes it, to make the battery um, and this is what China does. This is their. They're all the China, from China. playbook. Yeah. This is yeah. the China playbook. They are trying to, uh, you know, put companies like us out of business. And then when we are, then they can raise their prices. This wow. is all subsidized by the Chinese government. It is not news. This is you know right. that's kind like of they've done it in every other industry, every electronics, every industry, toys, yeah. whatever. Right? That's right. I mean, so the furniture. the nice thing about it is, since those batteries are not listed, we still have our. Our, our markets in you know the RV OEM market the uh, the the more regulated I guess the more regulated industries the more regulated markets so obviously in the the aftermarket it is it is less regulated right. uh, so our goal to combat this is basically to continue to make the best product mm-hmm. on the market to continue to innovate to offer new features and uh, obviously the best customer support yeah so that's why because we do get this in comments you know that battleborns cost a little more you know but that's what you're paying than, for safety i know yeah, yeah. But, but that's well we we ship legally yeah that's i mean that's that an, that's that's uh, like almost 50 expense. bucks a battery to ship hazmat 
Wow. And that's wow. not trivial. That's just one example. You and know, a we, lot of companies don't do that. Those comp those Amazon mm -hmm. batteries, right. they don't do that. Wow. So um, you know, it's it's something that it's not a fight that we focus on because ultimately we're not in a race to the bottom, we're in a race to the, the top. top. There you go. Right. That's very cool. That's so very if you were which I know you know a ton, right? You're you've been speaking over my head since you <laughs> sat down. But um if you were a, a consumer in our industry and you wanted to um get in lithiums, what would be the three main things that you would look to see that a company has before you even considered them? I'd look for um a pack listing. That's the most important thing. If you see a pack listing, then you know it has a BMS and you know that it was designed to uh, maintain vibration and impact mm -hmm. and short circuit and, you know, it, it can withstand some abuse. So that's really it. Uh, the 2054 listing, the 62133 listing. Okay. Um, so, or a 1973 listing, uh, which is a little less common and more for larger systems, but that's what. That's what I'd look for. That BMS is a big deal. So battery monitoring system, correct? So to prevent short circuits, and I've done this before. So like, okay, uh, you see it all the time. Like back, you know, old school, you need your car battery jumped or whatever, right? And you get the the jumper wires onto the battery, right? And you give it the old ch -ch -ch, the old spark, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, we, you know, we've got power. If you were to do that with a legit live PO battery, like this Battleborn here with a BMS, and you were to try it with that, it protects the circuit and you don't have the spark. Is that correct? You get an, an initial spark. Initial spark. Uh, yeah, but if there is if there is a dead short, the yep. BMS can detect that and then and cuts the it'll battery. cut it off until the load is removed. Wow. I see so, that's smart. That's you know, yeah. It's that's I mean, that's the goal is to try to make it foolproof. Yeah. You know, you'll never make something one hundred percent foolproof, yeah. but um, I mean you can if you throw enough money at it. But <laughs> yeah. I think we've reached a pretty good optimum when it comes to a foolproof battery that you know is is at least in in the realm of uh where it should be priced yeah you know notwithstanding what's out there from china yeah. that's a very tough competition but you know you, you've seen historically these things have come down uh from over 1200 bucks and they kept coming down mm -hmm. now we're kind of in a period of inflation and high interest rates and everything so it's a little tougher now but you know, over time, we do expect um, costs to to continue to come down. But the nice the nice thing for us is we are going to be onshoring the production of the cells, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's going to be game changing for any company. Because you asked if people do this here, here. in the United States, right. the answer is nobody makes these types of lithium iron phosphate cells yet. Okay, um, and yeah. there's certainly um, a, a push to get that industry onshore to de-risk ourselves from China because mm -hmm. China could, right. could always cut off supply. Yeah. If they cut off supply, our entire lithium market would be done, right? Yeah. Yeah. It would be pretty, pretty decimated. So uh, I don't foresee that happening. You know, we're, we kind of need each other. Right. Um, but at the same time, it does make sense for us to um, make sure that our, our energy future is not dependent on foreign countries yeah and there's no reason why it should be when all the resources are here so you guys are setting up trying to onshore everything what what's the only thing you rely on china for with your those battery cells. right now cells. just yeah, the cells. cells so we do have you know the bms we do have a contract manufacturer that i've personally been working with for like 10 years wow. so i, I kind of know them they're yeah. friends yeah um but that we could we could onshore at any time but the cells we could not we could not onshore so what one thing we don't talk about much because the the brand the company is known for RVs and boats and that sort of thing but mm -hmm. the whole reason the company was started was to manufacture cells domestically so all of our intellectual property portfolio has to do with developing manufacturing processes that you can deploy here here right so that that is a big part of this company is wow. that we are American innovation being deployed on American soil. That's amazing. So if you look at like Ford or GM that have gotten money to manufacture uh, 
lithium ion cells, they'll go get a partner from Asia, like right. a CATL, and bring them here to, de to, to deploy manufacturing here. But what is what sets us apart is we have our own technology that we've developed. And, you know, when we say we're a proud American company, like we, we are looking to actually deploy American innovation here. And that's been lacking. Yeah. That's no one awesome. else would say that really in, in that in that space. So I want to there's uh, several questions that we get um, when it comes to Battleborn because you guys don't produce certain things that we see in our industry. And I assume you have a reason for it. So one is like um, Chris and his boat does not run a lithium starter battery and you you guys don't offer one. And so one of those questions is why don't you offer a lithium starter battery? Is marine cranking battery? Yeah, yeah. So yeah there's a couple battery. couple reasons. Obviously, it's it's been on our radar for years, and we've kind of dabbled with designing such a battery. Um, the first reason I would say is uh, a lead acid starter works just fine, mm -hmm. and there's not a huge benefit to moving to lithium. There's you don't you get you pay the extra upfront cost, but you don't get the benefit of a long lasting right. deep cycle battery that actually makes it cost effective over time. Um, the bigger reason though, is that as you noted, every good lithium ion battery needs to have a BMS, which means that current is going through a circuit. Mm -hmm. And if you're cranking, if you use it exclusively for cranking, mm -hmm. then uh, you're putting a lot of power through the circuitry, and that's going to degrade the circuitry faster than the cells. Right. So the cells can do it, but it's actually the circuitry, the BMS that's on board that is not likely to last a very long time. Right. And we don't want to sell a battery that is you know going to do that. You sure. know? Right. Does it make sense? You explained yeah. it to me years ago when, when I first got on with the team here is I mean, you think about it as, um, I think you said it was a keyhole. So like the demand for cranking amperage, cranking amps uh, to crank over a V6 Mercury outboard, 250 horsepower. Um, you said when you crank that engine over, that keyhole required. So you've got, you know, your 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 live PO uh, cells behind the keyhole um, compared to, let's say I'm running my four electronics uh uh, you know, when you go to crank it over, the keyhole that's required to uh, expend that energy and deliver those cranking amps is is larger, right? I guess it's um, the discharge, a power discharge from cranking compared to a long, lower, smaller keyhole with my electronics over here. Uh, you explained it so much better. I don't, <laughs> I don't remember that explanation. Yeah, no, okay, maybe you didn't. Yeah, maybe you didn't. But the power required when you crank over an engine you know, through a cranking battery, it's just a lot larger. I mean, the the, the power expenditure is greater uh, in a small amount of time. Like one strikes and one's like more level, right? You're right. That's right. So when you crank a battery, it's high power in a short period of high time. High power, short yeah. power time. So you're not gotcha. taking, it doesn't take much energy, but it's high power. Yeah. And when you're running a deep cycle battery to power all of your electronics, mm -hmm. it's relatively low power for like a long Like your cell phone, like a cell phone lasts yeah, longer. Yeah, and that's where... That's where lithium iron phosphate does really great, right? Compared to AGM or a lead acid battery. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah. So I mean, a cranking battery. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, you know, so you can do it. I mean, we we have folks that have you know in in a pinch if you need to. But it's crank, pointless almost, right? But it's just, I mean, if it it from a cost effective yeah. standpoint, like That's a consumer right. shouldn't be worried about running a lithium starter. That's right. That's why we didn't do it. Yeah. Okay. So there are. I will say this. We're aware that there is a desire to replace a lead acid starter, uh, start cranking battery, um, and there are better ways to do it than that. And we are looking into those ways. Yeah. So we, okay. we do want to supply uh, the industry with with what it needs, and we're constantly innovating. And and yeah. I think it is we've had some pretty cool ideas on how to address that. That's cool. That's really cool. Get uh, and I know you don't advise us, but have you had customers that you know of? put that battery right there in his, you know, 2015 Chevy truck. Have, I mean, have you had guys yes. do that? Yeah. I mean, I've done it. Yeah. Have you really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So obviously that, that, that would be a cranking battery. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not that it won't crank. Right. You know, if, I mean, there, in some cases the, the battery, the BMS will interpret the crank as a short circuit and uh, cut it off. So it I might gotcha. not work. I gotcha. You know, but if that, if that, uh, current peak will get by the, 
the BMS, then sure. it'll crank just fine. You uh, know? Okay. But if you do it all the time, then it stresses the BMS. Over time. Correct. Okay. So another question is, you guys don't make a 36-volt battery. And we see that a lot in the fishing industry. Is there a reason why? Yes. Um, we have a lot of 36-volt systems out there, um, and they comprise three 12 volt batteries in series. Mm -hmm. And I still think that that is the best way to do it. Not to say that we're, we wouldn't make a 36 volt batteries. We, as I said, we're always thinking of better ways to do things. Um, but the main reason is one thing we didn't talk about the BMS is that the, the purpose of the BMS is also to keep the cells in balance. And what that means is you've got in a 12 volt battery, and stop me if I'm speaking. No, over no, no, you're fine. You've yeah. been speaking yeah. over my no, head. So so no, we're good. We're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. In a 12 volt battery, you've got three of these cells in series, and all the current runs through all of the cells. That's sure. what it means that they're in series. Um, but that means they don't share current. If they're in parallel, they share current. They're right. always at the same state of charge. Cells have a natural drift to them. And if they continue to drift, they can get out of balance. Right. So the way you get them back into balance is at the top of the charge cycle, if you charge this up to over 14 volts, um, you use what's called – the BMS will implement what's called a passive balancing circuit, uh, which means that a cell that gets to a higher voltage first mm -hmm. will start draining through a bleed resistor internally to let the others catch up. Catch up, right. right? That works – well for a 12 volt battery if you're keeping it charged up uh -huh. right for a 36 volt battery it works awful so hmm. if you have a 36 volt battery with that yeah. sort of passive balancing circuit you've got you know not four batteries in series but 12 batteries in series so the ability of the passive balancing mechanism to keep 12 batteries in series is what limits the longevity of that battery. It's just not going to, it's going to get out of balance and then it's over time. So its so, life cycle is much so, smaller than a yeah, 12 volt. And you'll see an accelerated decay because you're always limited by that first right. battery. And so, so, yeah, I've been on tour a long time, 13 years now, and I have seen more issues with charging, specifically charging 36 volt batteries for our trolling motors. I've seen more issues with that. I've seen more guys stranded on the bank before blast off, before takeoff than any other system, period. We were just in the Netherlands. Charles and I were just in the Netherlands, and there was some, I don't even, I don't even know the brand name of it. It was a 36-volt uh, uh, trolling motor battery. It had a beautiful little digital display on it. That meant nothing because it did mm -hmm. not work. Yeah, so think of it this way. You're limited on the discharge. You're limited by your lowest charge cell. Okay. And on the charge, you're limited by the highest charge highest. cell. So your charge will cut off when that highest cell gets to a, a higher voltage. Oh. But it could be at a much lower pack voltage than you Good. expect. Right. And as you're discharging, your lowest cell mm -hmm. will hit empty before all the others. And that could you could hit, you know, you you could cut off at like 36, 37 volts, you wow. know, way higher than you expect it to cut off. And that's the problem with imbalance. Yeah. That's why it's so important to capacity match ah. the cells. That's why we do what we do in, in our production facility. So um, if if and when we come out with a 36-volt option, we will have solved that problem. Wow. So it's almost like a, a baseball team, Texas Rangers or the Houston Astros. You're only as good as the as, as the weakest guy. I mean, yeah. literally. I mean, hey, little guy, you, you got to catch up, dude, or the team is just not going to work. And that's that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Wow. So, um, the 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 36 volt systems that we have out there are rock solid because we got three 12 volts mm -hmm. and you charge them all individually at 12 volts and therefore they're always in balance and you don't have to worry about that long-term effect of imbalance. That's a, yeah, that's really good insight. And also too, like I get it all the time is, okay, I want to get into lithium batteries in my, in my, in my nitro bass boat, my skier bass boat, my bass cat, whatever it is. The cool thing is 
is these batteries here. Uh, you guys have actually tested uh, most of the onboard battery chargers, the, i.e. the Minn Kota, the Noco Geniuses, the... Uh, the dual pro, I think, is what they call power Mo- pole charge. Power pole, yes, exactly. Uh, you know, most of these um, bass boat manufacturers they come with an onboard charger. I mean, right? That's convenient. It's convenient mm-hmm. for me. That's convenient for Steve and Bob and Tony. Um, you know, if we just plug into a, a just a regular charging cord and just don't even think about it. Um, you know, enable to um, you know swap my AGM battery take that 80 pound beast out of my boat and then put this 30 pound light uh powerful battery inside the really cool thing and i tell people all the time like the coolest thing ever is on an agm setting on that onboard Minn Kota charger or power pole charger whatever it is this thing charges well, up just fine that well that's my question i actually have a question on that when it comes to the chargers and what you've seen what are you looking for in those chargers so that they work with your lithium batteries and what what problems have you come across? Charging a 12 volt battery is not that big a deal. There's only one thing that we really worry about, and those are chargers that can't go above 13.6 volts. Volts. You want to get up over 14, preferably to 14.4, because that's where the balancing happens. If you're only charging to 13.6 volts, you never balance. So that problem that I was talking about mm-hmm. with the 36-volt system will will be a problem even for a 12-volt system. So as long as your charger can bulk up and absorb at 14.4 volts, then you're good. And yeah. almost every charger does that. Yeah. Okay. I, well, cool. you hear a lot about like, okay, maybe top each battery off. Is mm-hmm. that where that comes into play? Because That's maybe exactly the right. the charging system isn't doing that, so you should do it on your own. Yeah, so when you have three batteries in series and you've got a multi-bank charger, that's great because it will top off each individual section at 14.4 volts and that ensures that they're all in balance. Right. So that's what you're that's that's all you really need to worry about when it comes to charging. Okay. Yeah, and by the way, like I if I, you know, for those of you viewing if this is like conversation is above y'all's head, uh, just, just remember, like I've been doing this a long time. There's literally two things you do not want to skimp on when it comes to tournament bass fishing or boating in general. One is rain gear, right? It absolutely sucks being out there soaking wet, cold, even during the summertime. And two is batteries, literally. I mean, it is much, much, much better to make the invi- the initial investment of rigging your boat out with quality batteries uh, you know, when you buy the boat or, you know, maybe you get a tax return, whatever it is, rig it out to where you don't have issues in the future. And, uh, and that's a, that's a big deal because you go to a Walmart or something like that and put some junk batteries in, go to Amazon, put some $300 lithium batteries in, you're just asking for problems in the future. You know, it's just like having a, a cheap set of rain gear. I mean, holes in rain gear, it's not, not going to work out well for I've you. I've got another charger question that a viewer asked. Is it bad to leave lithiums charging 24-7? Like if you if your boat's in the garage and you're not fishing for a month, can you leave it on charge the whole time or should you unplug it when it when it's at full charge? That's a good question. Um as long as it floats, typical float is 13.6, that's fine. You can leave that plugged in. And float is after the initial charge of 14 plus volts. Yep. The float phase is towards the end of the phase where it just hangs out at 13.8, That's you it. said? So most most chargers do this, but the float is what allows the batteries. If, if you're plugged in, it allows, if you've got like uh, equipment that needs power, it'll power that equipment without draining the batteries. Uh, so 13.6 will keep a balanced battery fully charged. Okay. Um, but but you don't have to do that. If you've got phantom loads on your boat or on whatever system you have, phantom, phantom loads? loads are if you have like an LED light or oh, if you've yeah. got a display or something that's just on all the time, Clock or over whatever. time that'll drain the battery. So you can't, obviously you have to keep it plugged in under those conditions. Otherwise, if you just disconnect the batteries, then you're good there too. Just right. make sure they're disconnected. Right. Okay. So. And that's why it's always good to have a, a Perco on-off switch where you're disconnecting all of your it's power. Always, yeah, it's convenient to yeah. have those. But yeah. honestly, floating the the bat, keeping it plugged in, is just fine. Yeah, good to know. And then you, when you talked about your rain gear, um, a lot of people mentioned that some lithium batteries they noticed are waterproof and some aren't. Mm-hmm. Um, how? 
can you differentiate or what makes a battery waterproof and why does that matter so much? So we, I can say we just recently had our battery third party tested at the Intertech lab to IP65. So that that does make it splash proof. Um, but no, you can't submerge the battery. Right. I mean, if you're submerging your batteries, you got other problems. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> true. Uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, a waterproof battery, if you're, it, it's, uh, we've designed this so that we could, like we have submerged it and, and it and it's come out unscathed, but it's hard to maintain that kind of seal over about, time. Yeah. So that's why we've sort of strived for that IP65 rating because obviously the batteries will get wet mm -hmm. um, and we want we want to be able to... Splash proof, yeah. Yeah, just splash proof yeah. to make that's sure that's not a problem. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't call it waterproof. Yeah. Right. So that's another thing to look for, IP65 yeah, rating yeah. Mm -hmm. on the battery. Yeah. You okay. see a lot of chargers and things that have like, a, a, you know... A, you know, some uh, third party chargers, yeah, Dual Pro or any of these other ones, some of the cheaper ones, Schumacher or whatever it is, you know, that they have that IP65 rating mm -hmm. or some of the other ones. Uh, what, um, so like outside of the onboard battery chargers, what, what other manufacturer can you recommend? I think I know the answer to this. What other manufacturer do you recommend for charging a lithium battery? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't want to pinpoint one, one in particular. Right. Obviously, I mean we've we've worked with a lot. A lot. We yeah. we, we as a company we sell a lot of Victron. Yep. You know Victron. that, that yep. um, th their their chargers work really well. But I mean, there's there's a lot of chargers. It's yeah. not not complicated. It's not complicated yeah. to make a charger that goes up to fourteen point gotcha. four volts. Yeah. So yeah, Good I think know. a lot will work. Um, another question. Um, a lot of people had was lithium in cold weather environments, mm -hmm. especially our guys who are way up north, you know, New York and all of that. How does that work? Can they run lithiums, you know, if they do live in those places that get really cold? Yeah, this is it's kind of a misconception here that lithiums don't work in cold temperatures. It's it's half true. So you shouldn't charge your lithium battery in very cold temperatures. Mm. But you can discharge it just fine. And in okay. fact, it works better than your lead acid or AGM battery in cold, in cold temperatures. In the huh. discharge phase. Yeah, it actually okay. works a lot better. You can get high power, you know, at zero degrees out of this battery and wow. still come pretty close to 100 amp hours, whereas you don't get anything out of a lead acid wow. battery at zero degrees. So, I mean, that's something that is kind of... It, a myth. It's, it's a myth, yeah. But But what is not a myth is... Putting a large charge on a cold battery, lithium battery, could be bad for any lithium battery. Mm -hmm. um, and so that could cause what's called lithium metal plating, which which could degrade the cell a lot faster than wow. you want. And so we prevent it in our batteries like you can't. We Our BMS will measure the temperature and say, okay, it's too cold to charge, so we're not going to allow wow. the charge. So you just warm it up and then charge it. Uh, we also have... Uh, this particular model we have here is an internally heated battery wow. where we've got this heat enable where if you connect this to any positive in your system, it will enable a heating circuit. Will It'll keep it just above freezing so that you can always charge it. Very so we're, cool. yeah, so we're concerned with uh, the temperature of the lithium phosphate cells, not the BMS. Mm -hmm. BMS could take care of itself in sub-zero temperatures. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the physical attributes of of lithium phosphate at those sub sub zero. Yeah. Level. So inside the cells, when it's really cold, the lithium ion just doesn't move as fast. Okay. And that's why, the, but the electron moves really fast even yeah. if it's cold. And so that's why you can get a different reaction than what you want when you're charging it. <laughs> and that's so, what it is, a reaction. I guess, you, like you said, the, the lithium cells are actually moving around in there quickly. But yeah, the lithium ions move back and forth between the anode and the cathode inside the cell and the electron moves back and forth through the load or the charger creates, outside the and cell. And creates energy. Yeah. And so the the lithium ion and the electron, they meet each other at the anode okay. or at the cathode okay. depending on whether you're charging or discharging and a reaction happens there to get 
the lithium to stay at the anode or cathode. And back when you were teaching at USC, you'd come back home to your to your garage and you would study this. Like, can you physically see it, like under a microscope? Can you? No, s- no you can't. No, you can't see. No. It. So, yeah. If I can nerd out a little bit here, yeah. we've we've <laughs> been establishing a world class battery lab here where we have equipment now that can observe Holy the lithium cow. ion moving back and forth. Um, it's actually, we're working with a company in uh, in Europe called Bruker, and they mm-hmm. have this, it's a nuclear magnetic resonance machine, NMR, which if you're an athlete, you've heard of an MRI image yeah, yeah, yeah. or something, that's NMR. Okay. But instead of looking at, you know, what's in your knee, you can look at lithium ions wow. moving back and forth. So that we're actually awesome. coming up with... Well, we're not coming up with, but we're working with companies that are coming up with incredible ways to image the chemistry of what's going that on inside cool. the cell. That is cool. Yeah. Wow. That's really neat. And we had the, this conversation because uh, we were just in Vegas, giant solar farms in Vegas, right? And of course, uh, Dragonfly Energy, Battleborn uh, as a company, you guys work a lot with solar charging and, and solar maintaining. Um, solar power, right? I mean, it's 2023. I mean, it's 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 pretty much everywhere. Do solar panels also have little things that move in it, or no? No. Well, we're getting real science. Yeah, here. I, That's love cool. I love okay. it. I love it. Yeah. Um, the so the way a solar panel works is it's a it's a semiconductor okay. junction. Um, and when a photon from the sun, the sun, that's yeah. the electromagnetic radi- radiation from the sun hits that junction, uh-huh. it kicks up an electron that ends up going through the load. So physically, physically. Uh, it, so why, sorry, what I mean by kick up an okay. electron, it, so an electron goes from, I, I'm going real technical. Go do it. It, goes yeah. from, it goes from the its ground state to the valence band okay. of the semiconductor, which means it's free to leave. So ah. if you can kick up an electron out of that energy state, it will go through the load and power your load. And that's how a solar cell works. Wow. That was invented, you know, many decades ago. Long time ago, ago yeah. yeah. So is that is that uh, Las Vegas Solar Farm and if you guys aren't familiar, just just look it up on Google Satellite, like look up Las Vegas and just to the south and they're updating it frequently, but like the solar farm there, it, it, is it the biggest in the world, do you know? I don't know. It is huge, man, that solar farm out there. It goes for it's miles. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, that's good. That's yeah. a good thing. It's a good thing, right? Free energy. Yeah, right. It is. So really. I have three questions left on my list, and I'm going to say these are from viewers, and I have no clue what they're talking about, but I'm going to throw them out there to you. Okay. So if I say anything wrong, I'm sorry, because <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, this actually was brought up by a couple of people and the question is 12 volt versus 16 volt for electronics. Does that make any sense to you or what's better? So how do they even, how, why do they even ask about 16 I volts? I don't know, but multiple people did. So um, This sounds like more of an electronics question than a battery question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I can say that if you have higher voltage batteries that, uh, are powering certain things like LEDs that are tuned for lower voltages, you can do damage there. Mm-hmm. But in general, higher voltage electronics are more efficient than lower voltage electronics. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what they're getting yeah, at. But... Neither, me neither, yeah. Then another one was about the future of sodium ion technology. Is that? that yes, that does mean something to me. So uh, the way a lithium ion battery works that I was talking about, how the lithium ion goes back and forth between the anode and the cathode, uh, you can make a similar battery that uses sodium ion instead of a lithium ion. Okay. Uh, and that is of interest to people because sodium is really cheap and very prevalent compared to lithium. It's everywhere, right. Um, and it is a thing. Uh, it's The problem with sodium is the technology is not quite there yet. Um, it will never be as energy dense uh, as a lithium ion battery. So if there is a role for sodium ion, it'll be more like a lead acid ta- type battery. Gotcha. Um, it could potentially be cheaper. Uh, right now, the sodium ion batteries that are on the market still use organic electrolytes, so they might be safer, but there's still some flammability associated with them. Hmm. Uh, so I, I, yes, I do think there is a future for sodium ion battery, but no, I don't think it's a displacement of lithium ion batteries. Okay. Hmm. And then the last one, um, do lithiums have internal filters to reduce interference? 
I guess, with electronics. I don't know. Uh, well, there's no reason you can't put in filters to mm -hmm. reduce interference. Uh, we haven't had a need to put it into our battery packs. Um, so uh, I don't know. I don't have anything else to say. Yeah. I, like yeah. I said, I don't understand that. I'm just what, relaying them. What is your take on, um, I guess, electric cars? Because electric cars run on lithium technology, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, have you, uh, do you see a future here in our country where everyone is running, uh, lithium powered cars? Uh, and also have you ever met Elon Musk? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I went to the Gigafactory grand opening back in 2016 and I saw Elon Musk, yeah. but I have never, I've never met him. Okay. Gotcha. Um, in terms of electric vehicles, there is certainly a desire, uh -huh. especially by the, the current administration uh -huh. to, to basically get everybody to drive an electric car. Is that feasible? Um, is it feasible? Mm. There, well, there's not. Lithium is not coming out of the ground fast enough to do it on the time scale that they want. Wow. Um, but what what we as a company, mm -hmm. Dragonfly, what we see as the more important issue is the electric grid. Because if everyone has an electric car, it's going to overpower the electric grid. Right. Unless you're building more fossil fuel burning plants, which kind of right. defeats the purpose. The whole, so, yeah. Yeah, so what what we'd like to see happen is while electric cars become more popular and they're great, I mean the acceleration is fun, you know, I've it's heard. Pre it's pretty cool. Do you it, drive one? I don't. Yeah. Um but I mean there's a role for them for sure. I mean yeah. it takes air pollution out of the sure. cities. I Absolutely. mean they're they're really cool. It's a good um, balance for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, but I think we need to bolster the grid and yeah. we need I think we need more other types of energy sources on the grid other than gas and coal burning plants to to basically make it more sustainable from right. an environmental point of view um Interesting. My, i mean my i can tell you my background is in atmospheric science and i was interested in when i was a professor i worked on small particles and the effect of small particles on climate change oh, wow. in the atmosphere so climate change for me was never an issue of debate it, it, it's it's obvious what happens when you burn carbon dioxide. Okay, right. And it's it's been sad. I think there's less debate over it now, but it's been sad that over the years there's been this climate hoax narrative. That right, somehow there's right, a, right. But it's it's actually not. It's it's, it's like really obvious yeah, what absolutely. happens when you when you make carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Yeah. Um. And I think that for two reasons. Number one, coal and gas and all the fossil fuels are they they are not renewable like mm -hmm. they will be expended so it yep. makes sense to figure out how to get off of them Alternate, yeah um but also it makes sense to sort of preempt the nastiness of climate change that yeah, that, that climate change could bring and i yeah. think we are seeing uh, unfortunately some basically evidence of what climate climate change can do now yeah. our poor polar bears and it, it whale all that stuff yeah man. it's yeah. like it's, it's happening it so, is it is I, I'm not, I don't want to just say, well, let's just give up and see what happens. Right. It'd be nice to be like, hey, you know what? Let's just burn less. And it's good for the economy yep. to, if we can innovate and actually yep. Im implement new technologies. So long, that was a long story. Sure, no, but yeah. that's why I think changing the power grid here in the United States and demonstrating how it can be done globally is yep. so important. Yeah, it's huge. Do you think they'll ever make like um, a 250 horsepower bass boat that's fully electric? I don't know if that's possible. I don't know. I, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> Mercury, just, Mercury just came out I, with an electric I, engine, yeah. I mean, I, I do think it's possible, yeah. yes. Yeah. I mean, you, especially on a boat, you can, uh, you're, you're not as, you're not as hindered by weight as yeah. you are in, like, they're, they're making electric semis, you know, right. so yeah. I don't see why you can't make a very high power boat. Mm -hmm. Um I don't, I don't, I said this, this is where you talk over my head. Yeah, I don't know what yeah. the benefits of that would <laughs> yeah. be for, right. yeah. for you, but I will, uh, I will bring up now that, uh, I've been bass fishing once yeah. in my life. <laughs> Do we need to change that? And yeah. it was, it was with Rick Klun. So. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. oh, dude. That's that a good is one. The That's guy. the best yeah, one. Rick. It was an incredible experience. Yeah. I, mean, I did, I went out, um, with our, with our marketing team. I yeah. went out, uh, I think it was a couple years ago now to, 
hang out with Rick at his home. A little cool. off grid setup. It, it was so much fun. And, you know, we, I got to talk to him a lot and I got to kind of learn about his background, which is su- such an interesting, incredible background. And then to go out and actually have him teach me how to, how to cast fish, how, how to fish. cast. Yeah, very neat. It was a surreal experience. And it was such a beautiful day. Mm-hmm. And, Anyway, it is. Great experience. That's awesome. Good guy. Thinking everyone watching, they know like those, you know, Rick Klein is just an absolute legend of the sport. It's two, really cool. Two when, legends of each industry, right? Yeah. The top before, in fishing, yeah, top be, in lithium. Yeah. Before he took you out, a matter of fact, he did call me and said, and, and wanted to kind of ask me about Battleborn Lithium. And, and, you know, I gave him my spiel and I said, dude, zero issues for the three years I've been running them. And uh, he was very, very interested. I'm glad to see that it all worked out and, and and uh, everything worked out great. So, and what's cool too is is you guys support uh, bass anglers. You you support some several elite series guys, John Cox, uh, the Drews, a couple of these other guys out here on, on circuit and uh, yeah, circuit. Swindle. Yeah, no pun intended. Yeah. yeah, Gerald Swindle. All these guys are very very happy with their stuff, and uh, and it's just been it's it really has oh. been a oh, great sorry. experience being on the water and knowing literally knowing this is not like a plug or anything knowing like dude i could go all day whether it's the st lawrence river up in uh, upstate new york uh in you know six mile an hour current i'm running that 36 volt trolling motor into the current all day long does not matter or running one of these batteries to power four or five of my electronics the live scopes the live technology all that there's that peace of mind hey i've got zero holes in my rain gear like that peace of mind is like invaluable for what I do, for what we do, and uh, it's it's been great. Um, but he, I can tell he's about to wrap this thing up. <laughs> I I know my tone. Yeah, yeah, his tone changes. Yeah. <laughs> um, one question is, what have in the marine industry been that you've seen have been the biggest hurdles? Have there been any it, in 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 the marine industry in general? Um, I would say it is the uh, the problems with insurance companies and the um folks are gun shy about putting lithium right. on their on their boats in ter- in terms of like the sailboats and um open water boats but if if you if you're talking about angling the biggest hurdle really has been getting over cost yeah i think you right. know we, we came out and um you know it's a it's clear to us that this is an incredibly price sensitive industry mm-hmm. um and in the current economic climate where we are it's uh, you know it's been difficult to compete but we've been learning a lot about the industry and and we've been doing our best and you know i appreciate you saying that that you're having good experiences oh, with, yeah. our, with our it's batteries awesome. out on the water yeah. and all i can say is you know we're we're going to continue to do better and put out cooler products so you know stay tuned that's awesome it's got to be super frustrating like knowing these other companies are importing these batteries knowing they're not you know going through the correct channels to get these approvals and certifications safety issues that's got to be that's got to be so 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 frustrating being undercut like that you know like the, from your competitor that's you know it, it's got to be frustrating i don't think about that really? too much yeah. honestly it's like yeah i mean i guess it, it kind of sucks that we yeah. you know i'd like to have a greater greater traction in that yeah. market but our focus is on innovation and yeah. you know when i when i talk about uh cell manufacturing and i i talk about you know fancy NMR machines and stuff. That's what my focus is. That's awesome. And that's not something that those guys do. No. And so I just feel like we're Good. in a different league. Good. That's how I feel about like swim bait fishing, for example. <laughs> like I could, I could talk about it all. Uh, and I, you know, and I could give away secrets and things. And, but, and I know in my head, like I'm above the rest of the, you know, my competition or whatever it is. Cause I know what they don't. I know I'm going to work my butt off to be the best at this one thing. And that sounds like what you're doing there. So, um, so yeah, we're going to go head over to the Battleborn, um, a Dragonfly Energy facility. We're going to see how these things are and manufactured and made and things. Dragonfly, we'll do a little vlog. Dragonfly is the actual company, right? Yes. Battleborn's yeah. a brand within the company. Yeah. The Battleborn batteries brand is our, is our retail brand. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and Nevada is the Battleborn state. That's yes. awesome. why that came about. Very cool. All right. Well, Dennis Ferris, it was awesome having you on. Before we let you go, I mean, you are the founder, CEO of Dragonfly Energy. You've taught at uh, excellent schools. You're a father as well, right? Yeah, I have two kids. Oh, two kids. Okay, cool. So as we part ways here, 
uh, what kind of life advice can you give the viewers, whether it's batter? No, okay, let's, not batter related, <laughs> just life advice as a father, as a successful businessman or entrepreneur or, uh, you know, uh, just innovator, whatever it is. How about some life advice as we, as we wrap it up? Well, I guess the best life advice I can give is to find what you're passionate about and do it. That's awesome. It looks like you guys have done that. Yeah. So yeah. good job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Dennis. And so have you. So thank you. And so is Charles. Charles is running the cameras back there. He he loves his job, doesn't he? <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to head over to the Dragonfly Energy Facility, and we'll bust out a few vlogs over there. I'm really excited. After all this we talked about this morning, we'll uh, can't wait to see how it all comes together. So thank you, Dennis. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. On your set. Yeah, welcome to my set. Yeah, but thanks, yeah, guys. It was it was it was a great pleasure to be here. Thank, Thank you, Dennis. Thanks.